Hello, and welcome to the Camperdown Ramming Victoria, 128 years ago today. Now, two things. I will apologise. This video is being recorded rather later than I was hoping to today. I was hoping to do it earlier. I didn't manage to get a chance to record it earlier today. Um, so, it's going to go up later. It's been recorded later. This is now... 20 past 7 I'm recording it about 90 minutes long so yeah I can imagine it will be going up around about 9 o'clock if not 10 o'clock tonight but hey I hope you enjoy it when it comes up and it is Tuesday the 22nd of June now normally when I do history I lay out the facts, I give a large chunk of analysis, but I try and leave it so that you, the audience, can draw your own conclusions. Today I'm going to do something a little bit different because honestly, the point about Camperdown rounding Victoria is a communication one. And it's not just communication in terms of words we choose, but it's the audience you're aiming it for and understanding your audience. It, it matters. And it doesn't always come down to this. There are people who focus on different things, but it uh, Camperdown Ramming Victoria is very much a communication issue. There was an issue in communication between... George Tyrann and Albert Hastings Markham. Tyrann was the commander-in-chief of the Mediterranean Fleet. Markham was a rear admiral and commander of 2nd Division. Markham was a British explorer, author, had wandered all around the world and designed the flag of New Zealand. I'm not going to be getting onto all these things. And he was a subordinate. And there is an issue of communication between him and his boss, which means that a very vital ship gets lost and his boss dies. And it's got me thinking when I was looking into this communication about how communication is important when we're talking about things. These days, you will often see on Twitter opponents, if they're on, are described as being fascist, when actually what is meant is authoritarian. Because words have specific meanings. If you are talking about a controlling body that's very firm, very rigid, that's authoritarian. The other word has all sorts of other connotations. And the good thing about authoritarian is it can be a right-wing government, a left-wing government, if you're calling the government authoritarian, and both work. I would tend to call China a one-party or authoritarian gerotocracy before I called it a communist state. Because I think, or even a Maoist state, because I think that more accurately describes their system of government. Their government is a very strong central government, ergo authoritarian. It's a gerotocracy because the people who get to the top mostly seem to get there as a product of age, i.e. you're getting 80-year-olds, 90-year-olds, very older members having a lot of power. They have a lot of experience, so you can, to extent, understand it. That's China. That would be what I would at some of China. And that would be more accurate. This is the point. Accuracy helps because if you just use an easy easy word to you that can undermine people you think that's lovely but it doesn't actually illuminate anything and it doesn't build your case it might speak to your base it might speak to people who already agree with you because they go yeah we agree with that yeah we don't like them but it doesn't explain why you disagree with them because 
your opponents or people who don't necessarily disagree with you or don't understand you won't understand why you're saying it. They'll just see you using a catchphrase and think, well, that's obviously not the case. That's a straw man argument. They're obviously not that. So, no. Again, if we're talking about the British government and many governments' actions during COVID, they have been authoritarian. Now, you can argue the situation justifies that. And you can argue that as long as they start to ramp down those restrictions, when the situation eases to the point which they can, it doesn't matter. That's a good case to make. That's a strong case to make. You can also argue that yeah, perhaps they've gone a bit too far in some areas. They've been a bit too excessive. There is It's a hard and finite balance to, uh, to strike, like any communication issue. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because this whole idea of authoritarian command versus, let's say, band of brothers command comes into Camperdown and Ramming Victoria. The Victorian Navy has a very authoritarian approach to command structures in that quite a lot of officers are used to a system whereby their commanding officers give them incredibly detailed instructions. Objective-led command is certainly not a feature of the, the, uh, the scenario, command structure of the Victorian Navy. But you can argue, certainly, that George Tyrann was trying to introduce it. He really was. And that is where all the issues come from in this scenario. Because you have a senior officer who's trying to introduce it, introduce a more devolved command, a more thinking command to juniors, and a relatively senior officer who's junior to him, who has come through a system which doesn't have space for freedom of manoeuvre, and therefore has a far more trouble exercising independent command, and maybe even questioning command. Because that's the other thing. You have to foster a command structure where subordinates are allowed to question their seniors. A constructive question. And are you quite sure, sir? Or, yes, sir, that is an option, but there's also, oh, certainly, ma'am. But if I'm understanding your intentions correctly, would not... Some uh, X and X be another, another thing to consider. There are many ways to do it. Being polite is the first one. Being a trusted source as a subordinate is a second one. I reliable. But most importantly, you have to be the sort of commander who will allow them to do that. Because a commander who has earned the respect and who gives respect to their subordinates can enable that kind of questioning without undermining their authority. And there is a point at which a junior is get, is pushing too far and is starting to undermine your authority. If they're questioning everything, every little thing, they are no longer constructive questioning. But as a commander, you will know. As a good leader, you will know the ones who are doing it, who are questioning just because they're questioning. The ones who are questioning because they are learning, in which case it's your duty to train them. And the ones who are questioning because you may or may not have a good idea. <clears throat> now, if you're a midshipman questioning a captain, that's very, very difficult. But if you're a captain who's had 20 years experience questioning an admiral who you're the flag captain of, then that's a different scenario. You've got experience question back. If you're a rear admiral and your commander's a full admiral, then question back. 
That's your job. It's literally in your job description. You're the second in command, or you are their flag captain. You're their chief of staff, the guy, a person in charge of their flagship. You are the next most experienced person sitting on that ship. It's literally your job, your entire purpose for being to question their commands when you think there is a problem. When there isn't a problem, don't say anything. It's easy. When there is a problem, say something. This is the whole thing with Campanel and ramming Victoria. So, it takes place off Tripoli, Syria. And it is, well, now modern part of modern Lebanon. Um, it's a big thing for the Royal Navy. That is a very, very important ship you see going down there. That is one of the most powerful, one of the most potent first-class battleships the Royal Navy has. Time. More importantly, it's the flagship of the Mediterranean fleet, the critical fleet of the Royal Navy at the time. It's the flagship of Sir George Tyrion, who is one of the best admirals the Royal Navy has. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been given the Mediterranean. This is what you're seeing. You're seeing something which is absolutely devastating. It was devastating to the world at the time. It sends reverberations around the world. It also shows that there is something around here which can sink these behemoths. Another one ramming it. <laughs> oh, I don't know. And it's an absolutely traumatic loss of life. HMS Victoria will sink with well, three hundred and fifty eight crew died, and three hundred and fifty seven crew were rescued. It's a fifty fifty split with one more on the side not surviving. So this is what hit her. This was the flagship of Rear Admiral Markham. It was HMS Camperdown. Now, Camperdown is not quite the same as Bembo. Bembo is of the same class, but an older variation. But it's a nice drawing to give you an idea of the layout of the ship. She's an Admiral class. And her sisters were Collingwood, Anson, Camperdown, Howe, Rodney, and Bembo. In many ways, Anson and Camperdown are the most uh, similar in design. But Camperdown is a fairly decent ship. She is a, a full... Admiral class, she's a full class one battleship. She's laid down on the 18th of December 1882, launched the 24th of November 1885, and completed in July 1889. She sold in 1911 and broken up shortly thereafter. She displaced 10,800 tons. So, about the same amount as a uh, treaty cruiser. Length, 100 meters. Beam, 20.88 metres, well, near enough, 21 metres, and draft, 8.31 metres. Power came from two Maudslay combined compound inverted steam engines. Um, that would provide it with 7,500 uh, IHP under normal circumstances, but um, 
with force draft could get to 11,500 IHP and provide a top speed of 17.1 knots at that point. Complement 530 armament for BL 13.5 inch guns in twin barbettes, for BL 6 inch guns in 12 in single mounts, 12 quick firing 6 pounder Nordfeld guns. 10 free pounder quick firing guns and 5 14 inch above water uh, water torpedo tubes and she is fairly decent armor for her time now camper down is a good little ship <laughs> 10,000 tons. She's a good battleship. She really is. And you would hope she'd be remembered for more than this, but really this is what she's remembered for. Not her bombardment of Crete or various other time uh, things she gets involved in. This. Now, the first thing I would say about the design, and you might agree with me on this, you might not, is it doesn't look exactly manoeuvrable or fast. It looks sturdily built. But honestly, I think you could lay HMS Victory's plan over that. And there would not be too much difference in the shaping. And HMS Victory, remember, is a sailing ship. In simple terms, navies are still developing their ships, their shapes. And the shapes you would see of ships later, Dreadnought, all those battleships, is different than you will see from the one from the Ironclad era. As they transition between age of sail and well Age of Empires. Now, this is a slightly more interesting vessel. This is HMS Victoria. The ship, of course, sinks. And as you can see immediately from her plan, she is different. Now, she only has two main guns. Two 16.25 inch guns in a single turret forward. She also has a 10-inch gun mounted aft, which is um, uh, really only has a gun shield. doesn't really have a turret or barbette system. She's got 12 6-inch guns, 12 6-pounder guns, and uh, 6 14-inch uh, torpedo tubes. She is, in every, every set of perpendiculars, better and bigger, theoretically. Than, uh, than Camperdown. Camperdown is, of course, named for Admiral Duncan, which the modern HMS Duncan is named for as well, and Victoria is named for Queen Victoria. She'd been uh, laid down on the 13th of June, 1885, launched on the 9th of April, 1887, and completed in March... 1819. She was three years old. One of her nicknames, well, she was three years old when she died. She, One of her nicknames uh, was the Slipper, and when her and sister, Sans Perel, were together, they were known as the Pair of Slippers, because of their shape, basically. They only have guns at the front. Complement, 430, has a flagship, 583. She was full when she went down. Displacement, 11,200 tonnes, so about 400 tonnes more. However, she gets power from two Humphreys and Tennant triple expansion engines that provided 800 indicated horsepower at natural or normal draft, and, or 14,482 indicated horsepower at force draft. This enabled their two screws to provide a top speed of 16 knots at normal, but a 17.3 knot top speed at force draft. So think about that. For her to get an extra 1.3 knots, they have to increase 
indicated horsepower by 6,482. And the camper down weighs slightly less, gets to 17.1 knots on 11,500 indicator horsepower with regular compound engines. This is what you're fighting with, with speed. Speed is about hull form, it's about displacement, and it's about power. It's about what you can put down into the water. She's a good ship, as long as she's moving. But the thing you would have to say about both these vessels is that Neva, Neva, is particularly manoeuvrable. I have said before that manoeuvrability if you're looking for a ship which is tends to be more maneuverable, a tighter turning circle, you want it to be fatter and shorter because that you want the beam to length ratio to be slightly less. If you want to be faster, you want a greater length to beam ratio, i.e. so length is three or four. The thing is with both Victoria and Camperdown is they haven't really they are trying to get a happy medium. So it's neither very fast nor very maneuverable. You would have to say they have got you know, they're not exactly a coracle, so they're they're not that bad when it comes to speed. But both are a hundred meters long. Both have a beam of roughly 21 meters, and both have pretty much the same draft. So honestly, despite their gun differences and despite their engine differences, one having a triple expansion, the other one having a compound engine, which is basically a triple expansion engine without one of its, without one of its chambers, but I'll talk about that in a bit, they are pretty much the same hull and the same ship. Yes. This might be a shock to the world out there, but you can build multiple classes of ship which are very, very similar. 100 meters by roughly 21 meters beam. 100 meters length, 21 meter, roughly 21 meters beam. So they theoretically, for an admiral in charge, have similar handling characteristics. Not quite the same but theoretically similar. Which is important when trying to coordinate a fleet. So here is triple expansion engines. And by the way, this is a very, very cool GIF, which I have just got running still on uh, Wikipedia. But you can go find it on Wikipedia, this GIF, and it's really quite cool to look at. They've been around since the 1780s. That is compound engines. And basically, a compound steam engine, the idea is that the steam first expands into a high pressure cylinder, and then it goes into a lower pressure, uh, and losing energy, then goes into a larger, low, uh, larger, low pressure cylinder, as you can see. Now, the point is, someone eventually goes, hang on, but with steel, we can go for even higher pressure boilers than we have been doing already. Okay. And if we're starting off with a higher prior pressure, then perhaps we can have a lower... Uh, uh, we can have an intermediary pressure. And so you have triple expansion. And later you even have quadruple expansion engines. So those come in well after turbines have started existing. The point is, this is a very efficient very stable piece of technology. It can really help you get the maximum amount of energy out of the steam and the coal. 
ca you're carrying. And that's the big thing. The big advantage of Victoria over Camperdown was the fact that she could get the same distance, she could get a similar performance, and a lot more horsepower from less coal. So if she carried the same amount of coal, she could go even further. Or she could carry more armour. That's the theory. It's efficiency. And it matters. Mm -hmm. So, first officer we're going to be talking about is Captain Charles Johnston. Now, Captain Charles Johnston is... And I put this politely. One of the more interesting characters in this. He is the captain aboard HMS Camperdown during the collision. And I couldn't find a picture of him, so here is a picture of Camperdown's bow after the collision. He was made a lieutenant in 1865. He was a command made a commander in 1877. And was promoted captain in 1883. So, in 1893, he'd been a captain for 10 years. He'd been in the Navy for more than 30 years. He had already been the captain of HMS Ajira, HMS Dryad, HMS Volagi, HMS Mercury, HMS Narcissus. HMS Agamemnon. He had experience. He is an experienced captain. Yet his ship rounds his flagship. Rear Admiral Albert Markham. Now, again, this is Admiral Hastings, Albert Hastings Markham. Uh, he's the fifth son of a Royal Navy officer. He has travelled around the world. He's been through the Arctic as part of the, of the British Arctic Expedition in 1875-6 on HMS Alert. Um, he's been thanked by the Canadian Parliament for his work and served on the Royal Geographical Society for many years. Wrote many books. This is an erudite, learned officer who has got a lot of experience. He was made a commander in 1872. In 1876, he is promoted to captain. And in 1891, he'd been promoted to rear admiral. He joined the Royal Navy in 1856. So in eighteen fifty six and from eighteen fifty six to eighteen ninety three thirty seven years service. as a captain and admiral. 
17 years. Again, an experienced officer. He'd also designed the flag in New Zealand, which is still the flag to this day. So um, I would be tempted to call it the Markman uh, a flag, but you know, hey ho. Uh, interesting enough, he was, in 1868, he was appointed first lieutenant to HMS Blanche on the Australian station, and he helped suppress the blackbirding, that is, the illegal trading of slaves between Queensland and South Sea Islands. And this including spending time as captain as acting commander of HMS Rosario and 11 gun screw sloop He was not an, he had a fair number of issues at various points. Markham did. But we're not going to get into this. Then there's Captain Morris Book. book. Interesting enough, Morris's English uh, Wikipedia entry is practically non existent and terrible. However, he has a wonderful Portuguese one. Mm, which is where I actually found this picture. Hence my bringing it up. If you're searching the English ones and you're going, we can't find that picture, Dr. Clark. Where did you get that picture of Morris Bork? Well, I got it from Portuguese Wikipedia. Because apparently it hasn't migrated across to English Wikipedia. Who knew? He joined the Royal Navy in 1867. And... had a non a non-stop career from that point he really does have a non-stop career he's friends with various members of the royalty at one point they thought i think he might marry princess victoria um he is very very popular and he's a very successful officer at a certain level and he is the flag captain for sir george Tyrion. He is, in other words, the captain of HMS Victoria. So, he joined the Royal Navy in 1867. He's been a full captain since 1889. Four years as a full captain, so less than the others, but um, let's see. 1867. 26 years of service. And he has friends at court, so that's going to give him a bit of a better ego back up. And finally, we have Admiral George Tyrion. The gentleman who dies in this action. The one who's famous for this was saying, it's all my fault, which I'll be getting into later. Tyrion is, Tyrion is probably one of the most amazing officers of his age. He's one of the best admirals or the Royal Navy has possibly ever produced. He's certainly a thinking officer. He's an officer with extensive experience. He joined the Royal Navy in 1848. So by 1893, we are talking 45 years service. He's commanded the Australian station. He's fought in the Korean War and Crimean War. 
He's been awarded a KCB. He's been around the world. He's been made captain by 1866. And... Rear Admiral by 1884. So, he's been an Admiral for nine years. Rear Admiral, Vice Admiral. Technically, Vice Admiral when he dies. So, I should be putting out a Vice Admiral down, but yeah. He is an experienced, very trusted senior officer. Not only that. He was called the Akil Admiral and the, after the 1888 naval manoeuvres. Now, during these particular manoeuvres, there's a reason I'm bringing them up. It's the first time he really bumps into Markham. And for... Well, how do I, unless I'll just give you a bit of back history. The... British naval manoeuvres had begun in 1885, that of when they started as an annual manoeuvres, where the Royal Navy would divide into opposing fleets and, uh, fleets and com conduct f as war exercises as near as possible to rear conditions. So basically, these exercises were as close as they could get to full-on war. By 1888, this has become something rather interesting. There aren't the blockbuster cinemas, there isn't... All, all those other things we have today. This was something of interest to the newspapers and interest to the public and interest to the Navy. The Navy liked the attention because it gave them publicity for their greater uh, campaigns for greater funding. And in 1888, the, the intention was to test the practicality of blockading an enemy fleet in its home ports. When the ships were concerned, were modern iron steam vessels rather than traditional sailing vessels. It was hoped that a superior fleet, taking the role of the British, superior fleet, so British, would surprise an inferior enemy force before it could sail from two home ports. Trian commanded the Akil fleet, based in Bearhaven in Bantry Bay on the southwest coast of Ireland and Lost Swilly on the north coast. Tyrion uh, chose the nickname Akil Admiral for himself uh, because that's a small island midway between the two bases. Irish territory was considered friendly to Akil and hostile to their opponents. And the Akil fleet consisted of 19 major warships and 12 first-class torpedo boats. The ironclads in this fleet were Hercules, Ajax, Hero, Rupert, Warspite, Romney, Devastation, Invincible, and Black Prince. The unarmoured ships were Severn, Volage, uh, Volage Ar Iris, Cossack, Sandfly, and Finn, Calypso, Serpent, Curlew, and Spider. The opposing fleet, the, Royal, the one representing the Royal Navy, was commanded by Vice Admiral John K. Baird. And they had 26 major war strips and 12 first-class torpedo boats. England, Scotland, and Wales were considered the friendly bases from which the British fleet could operate from. And Baird's warships considered of Ironclads, Northumberland, Benbow, Collingwood, Monarch, Conqueror, Hotspur, Northampton, Agincourt, Inflexible, Neptune, Iron Duke, Belize, uh, Belle Isle, and uh, Shannon. Sorry. The unarmoured ships included Mersey, Arafusa, Ro Rover, Active, Raccoon, Rattlesnake, Thames, Inconstant, Mercury, Mohawk, Tartar, and Grasshopper. Now. So. The Royal Navy has put its smartest admiral, arguably at the time, in charge of the opposing fleet, the non-British fleet, to see what he does. Turin, rather like the Japanese versus the Americans in World War II, decided there was little he could do directly against the superior force. So decides he's going to wear them down using feints and false alarms to reduce their attentiveness and also to wear out their coal. As after all, they would have to maintain themselves continuously outside his ports. While he and his men could enjoy the delights of Ireland. And they did. 
they would have trouble with communicating at sea because the radio really was unavailable yet at this point it's as a practical means and Darren, Darren well he had a nice telegraph line between his two bases and could talk to them whenever he wished and boy did he talk And here is where Markham comes in, because Albert Markham is put in charge of the blockaders' squadron of cruisers. The primary job of them was to stay close to Bearhaven, watch for ship movements, and attack anyone who emerged, while the ironclads stayed further away. Day one, Tyrion's first feint. Uh, a two torpedo boats and a battleship are pretended to be sent out. Markham scurries to intercept. Then, for two days, he does nothing. Fires occasional shots from coastal batteries at Markham's ships, um, if they came too close. On the fourth evening, he sent out two torpedo boats with no light, showing no lights, and the idea was that this would create more false alarms. These boats didn't just create false alarms. He put good commanders in them, and they returned with four enemy torpedo boats, which they'd surprised and captured. You can see where this is going. By the 3rd of August, day 10, the enemy had been at sea for nine days, and aside from the tedium of their weight, were now low on coal. Mm-hmm. Nine days of having to steam back in the throw. Nine days of false alarms, of panics, of false signals coming. At this point, Tran orders all ships to be ready to sail at 9.30 p.m. on the 3rd of August. And most morning, for all the upper parts of the ships to be painted black. So they've gone from their traditional white and black to a fully black fleet. The fastest ships, Warspite, Iris, Seven, and Valaye, Cossack, and three torpedo boats left via the western entrance, staying as close to the shore as they dared and heading for the Atlantic. Tyrion, in contrast, took the remaining large ships and other vessels through the eastern entrance, giving the attempt of trying to break through the blockading ships. Within an hour, the ship he was using as his ship at this point, Hercules, in larger in larger group, was spotted. And excitement breaks out amongst the blockaders. Threon immediately turns around, heads back to port. It was only after they'd been in port and anchored that one blockader spotted Trion's escaping ships and they had got away. Admiral Fitzroy at Love Sully then pulls a similar fun joke on his blockading squadron and... Um, breaks out the blockade on the 4th of August, joining Trion's ships which had escaped. At this point, Baird realises he has no choice but to break off the blockade because he can't keep it up. He sends his deputy, Rowley, to guard Liverpool and himself proceeds to coal at Portland ready to defend the Thames and London. Fitzroy took his ships north around Scotland, destroying Aberdeen, Grimsby, Newcastle, and the ship's berth there, before returning to Lough Swilly. Meanwhile, Trian, no longer um, held in Berehaven, uh, took his slower ships to Lough Swilly, joined up with the slower ships from Fitzroy's command, and proceeded to attack Liverpool. He claimed Belle Isle, which had been guarding the port, as captured. 
destroys the shipping there, and Baird is forced to regroup his forces to defend London. We're leaving Threon in command of the rest of the British coast, including, of course, the English Channel. But more importantly, when the opponent is technically Ireland, the whole of the Irish Sea. <sighs> this is terrible, because... Um, Basically, he's won. At this point, the ODX size comes to an end. Thrian gets, of course, the usual criticism from various officers telling him, uh, saying he had not been proper. He not given merchant ships proper warning. He not allowed their crews time to escape as required under international law. He would bombarded the defence of cities and killed civilians. And he would used false flags and captured signal equipment. Terrible, terrible. And the Admiralty, in contrast, praises him and loves him. Most of those officers complaining were the ones he'd just beaten. You might have rules you expect yourself to play by and operate by in war. Those are the rules of it as you do, of conduct as you define. Do not presume your enemy is going to follow the same rules as you. In 1888, Trim acts exactly as the Germans would end up acting in World War I, as the British would occasionally act in World War I, as the Germans would act in World War II, and as the British would act in occasionally in World War II. You've heard me talk about Sing uh, a Sing Tao incident from January 1939. You've also heard me talk about the uh, the Asimamara incident of January 1940. There are a lot of incidents where Britain is forced to act that way, and where there are lots of incidents where Germany does act that way. Don't presume your rules are going to stay the rules. In 1889, they reverse things. Thrian is now the British fleet, and Baird commands the enemy. And this time, Trion wins. Um, yes, the enemy managed to attack various ports, but by the end of the uh, end of the battle, um, Trion and uh, Trion had managed to get himself far more of the enemy than they had. Although he hadn't managed to catch the cruisers, which suggested the Royal Navy needed faster cruisers. And, again, Trion is put in charge in the, in, of one of the team sides in the 1819 naval maneuvers. Where a number of captains were criticised for not taking the rules sufficiently seriously and continuing to fight their ships after they should have considered themselves sunk or captured. Interesting enough, Vice Admiral Batch of the German Navy publishes a critique, and I first found out about this by on the Wikipedia, then I looked it up. Also going, what? There was a German critique of them? Arguing that the 88 and 89 exercises, the objectives of the Admirals have become reversed from those of real war, where coastal raiders, raids would follow opportunistically to main fleet engagements, rather than being main aims of themselves. Well, I would say that's a very one-dimensional reading of naval history, for starters. But also, that kind of is more revealing about the German idea of war at this point than the British. 
This German idea is to fight the battle and then do the raiding. The British idea is to do the raiding to force the enemy out so you can fight the battle and then you can land troops and do everything else with impunity. Because the British idea is we're larger so you're going to hide in port from us. The German idea is that you'll come out and fight us. But this gives you an idea of what Threon is trying to achieve. He's a very good admiral. And he's trying to achieve a fleet which works together. His net problem is the command system. So, here is the point. He call, it's called the TA system. And to send signals requires hoisting flag sequence, waiting for all the ships to raise flags to confirm they had seen and understood it, and then lowering the initial flags to signal everyone to carry it out. Same system as you will find in use in World War One, as we talked about with Dogger Bank and various other ba uh, and Jutland and various other things. The signals go up, and when they come down, that's the signal to execute. And you'd wait for everyone else to hoist the same signals, so acknowledging they'd received the signals and got them correct, check, then come down, execute. It's rather complicated, and Trian wasn't the first certainly wasn't the last, to point out that in a battle, this could be problematic. This process would take a lot of time, and whilst it lovingly allowed an admiral to control every minute detail of his fleet in massive detail, with a code, uh, with a uh, book to describe, a signals book about that thick, it wasn't really practicable. And so he has a proposed simple signal that basically is the letter flag's T and A, which would instruct the captain to follow their leader. It's a radical departure of the time from existing practice, but let's be honest, it's not that radical in under modern circumstances, and it wouldn't have been that radical among, under Age of Sail. Now this has specific bearing on the cra on the accident and on the sinking. So this is why I've got it here. But I've also got some memorandums as a note. Three in circulate a memorandum to the Mediterranean fleet concerning safe manoeuvring of ships. Particularly in difficult circumstances, the first duty of a ship's captain is always to safeguard their ship, at least during the plan of peace. And should they ever be faced with an order which for some reason might be dangerous, then they should attempt to carry out the intention of the order but only if it could be done in uh, without risk to their ship or others. I.e. make your risk assessment and do it, work out how to best do it. He actually reiterates this before the collision in 1893, before the exercise which takes place. So, the next year. When the literal obedience to any order, however given, would entail a collision with a friend, paramount orders direct that the danger is to be avoided while the obje object of the order should be attained if possible. I.e. Figure out a way to do it, but without doing it and bashing in the enemy, your own ally. Furthermore, Queen's regulations required, if two ships under steam are crossing so as to involve risk of collision, the ship which has the uh, has the other on its starboard side shall keep out of the way of the other. There are two memorandums from an admiral, and there is the actual Queen's regulations. So, Duran is trying to get officers to think for themselves, as he sees this is the only way of actually dealing with potential conflict. He sees the Royal Navy is too scripted, too controlled, and its officers are too used to being told what to do and not thinking for themselves, and this is causing a problem. His actual fear is of the future generations of admirals and what will they come from. If they are so used to following orders, how will they make decisions when they become admirals? That's his fear. And in August 1891, he's taken command of a training station.
finest system in the Royal Navy. And this is what eventually happens two years later, roughly. Right column, Victoria in red, Nile, Dreadnought, Inflexible, Collingwood and Phaeton. Left column, Camperdown, Edinburgh, Sands Prowl, Edgar and Amphion. Please note something, and I don't consider this a particularly 100% reliable, but is fairly illustrative from other plans I've seen. And I've nicked it from Wikipedia because it is nice and clear colours, so you can see it, unlike some of the other drawings. A lot of those ships have not necessarily followed the route that they should have done if they've been following the orders. They've adapted. Now, here's the thing. Thrian is in charge of one of those divisions. A, col a column of six ships. And they're the first division of fleet, and they were travelling at eight knots. Just eight knots. Not 17.3 knots, eight knots. Rear Admiral Albert Hastings Markham is in the lead ship of six of the, of the lead ship of the second division in the Camperdown. His normal flagship, the Trafalgar, was being refitted at this point, which meant he also didn't have his normal flag captain with him. Here is the point it starts getting unusual. Threon had actually discussed his plans anchoring the fleet with some of his officers the night before. The idea, and this was what they were approaching for, to try and explain them. And to try and sort of discuss stuff. It's unusual for him to do that. But the idea was quite complicated. Two columns were to turn inwards in succession by 180 degrees thus closing to 400 yards and reversing the direction of travel. After travelling a few miles in this formation, the whole fleet would slow and simultaneously turn 90 degrees to port and drop their anchors for the nights. The officers, under discussion, had observed that 1,200 yards was much too close and suggested the columns should start at least 1,600 yards apart. Um, even this would leave insufficient margin for safety, they felt. The normal turning circles of ships meant <clears throat> sorry the normal turning circles of ships meant that you needed well again this is a rather interesting thing because um what's written in but some books changes on a thing of between 2000 yards and 2400 yards for space Some seem to think that the 2,000 yards will produce enough for the 400 yards space between them. Suggesting they expect each ship to turn in roughly 800 yards. But some think 2,400 yards which just need to reach 1,000 ships. Uh, 1, and some go even further and suggest 2,800 yards just to need 1,200. The fact is these ships require a lot of space to manoeuvre. They're not quite modern oil tankers. But don't think of them as speedboats, maneuverability-wise, okay? They are not good. Tyrion, Tyrion with during discussion, agrees eight cables or 1,300 meters is needed. Uh, well, that's 4,000. That's working out in yards to keep it to standard dimension. That's about 1,000 or 1,400. Uh, 
1,465 yards, roughly, 66 yards, roughly, will be needed. But when he sends the signal, he sends it as being six cables. Two officers do actually query whether the order was what he intended. He brusquely apparently commands them that it was. Okay. I see doing this. Now. The trouble is you have... Trin is habitually doesn't like explaining himself. Because he wants them to learn how to... His junior officers to learn how to handle unpredictable situations. He's also a bit of a strict disciplinarian. And... Believed the best way to keep his crews capable. And his officers available. Was by continuous exercises. Fleet evolution, so they call the time. The signals during this period, as it's before the invention of wireless, not practical wireless, were signal flag, semaphore, and signal lamp. So there are limits on what he's able to do. But he's trying his best. And he's trying to make them as experienced as possible. So he's giving these orders. He also, as well as the ordering the turn, orders the speed increased to 8.8 .8 knots. And at roughly 3 o'clock in the afternoon, or 1500 hours, orders a signal, a, a signal to be flown from Victoria to have the ships in each column turn in succession by 180 degrees inwards towards the other column so the fleet would reverse its course. Now, here again is where you get into debates, because normal, uh, not all ships turn exactly the same. And so when you see something like, right, it's like the normal tactical circle for a ship turning is 800 yards, and you go, really? Now, I've already discussed how there was a lot of similarities in the shape and the design of the hull of these vessels, but that doesn't mean they all turn out the same. And saying they're all normally turn at 800 yards is like saying... All, glass, uh, all glasses... ...of this design will hold exactly the same amount of liquid. They will do, if you're measuring in litres. Probably, if you're do measuring in milliliters, it will not be different than that different. But if you go down lower than that, you will find it's different. If you're talking in hundreds of yards, probably 800 yards is fine to talk about. But it won't be. It'll be, some might even do it less than 800 yards. Some might do it more than 800 yards. It's a good average. It's a good approximate, but it's not the reality. Here is the joy. Even in the massive signal book, there was no predetermined code for the maneuver he wished to order. So, Trion sends separate orders to the two divisions. First order. Second division, alter course in succession, 16 points to starboard, preserving the order of the fleet. First division, alter course in succession, 16 points to port, preserving the order of the fleet. Now here is the question. With the phrase preserving the order of fleet, was Trion intending that one division should turn outside the other so that they end up sort of crossing over each other uh, 
Man, one going inside and still preserving the starboard fleet, the starboard division still being the starboard division, and the port division still being the port division. We don't know. He didn't live for us to cross-examine him. His flag lieutenant was Lord Guilford. And he gives that, sends out the orders. Now, some of his officers, the ones we discussed in this was like before, knew what Trion was planning. They didn't raise an objection at this point. Markham, this is the rear admiral, at the head of the other column, was confused by this order, apparently, and this is this says officer, and delayed raising the flag signal in the king and understood it. At which point, Trion queries the delay in carrying out his orders, as the fleet was now heading for the shore and needed to turn soon. Um, he sent a semaphore signal to Markham, asking, What are you waiting for? Now, here is the point, Markham admits himself. He was stung by this public rebuke, so Markham immediately orders his column to start turning. You have just put your ego and your public image ahead of your ship when you're dealing with a potentially faulty order. That doesn't seem like the sensible thing to do in wartime and definitely not in peacetime. Now, most officers seem to have expected that Trion was going to give out another order and going to change his mind at some point, and so therefore they weren't worried about it. But, Captain Bork on Victoria asks Markham three times, asks Trion three times permission to order the engine to stern. And at the end, he only receives permission at the end, at the last one. Now, in the nicest way, if we again go back to this, Queen's Regulations, or Markham's own, on, or um, Trion's own orders, a ship, first duty of a ship's captain is always to safeguard their ship, at least during their times of peace. And should they ever be faced with an order which for some reason might be dangerous, they should attempt to carry out the intentional order, but only if it could be, do if it could be done without risk to their ships or others. Why did you wait for three times for you to put in reserve verse? And why did you wait for the Admiral to finally tell you? The whole point, I would say, is the Admiral was testing to an extent Bork. But he's also testing Markham. Because Trion, at the last point, shouts across to Markham, Go astern, go astern. At the last moment. When Markham does order a stern, unfortunately, their uh, the camper down is only has put up three quarters of stern, not full of stern. No one's not sure why Charles Johnston didn't really have a reason for why that's just what it did. It was a hot Thursday afternoon. Traditionally a rest time for the crew. And hatches and other means of ventilation were all open on the Victoria to cool the ship. The Camperdown's ram hits the starboard side of Victoria about 12 foot below the waterline and penetrated 9 foot into it. The engines were turning astern, and this caused the round to be drawn and let in more seawater before the water date doors on Victoria had been closed. Within two minutes after the collision, the ships were moving apart, which shows that if both had been put into reverse earlier, they might well have not have hit, or might have just been a glancing blow of the ships. Trion and his and Trion and his navigation officer. Um, Commander Thomas Hawkins-Smith didn't believe the ship would sink. As the damage was forward, 
and had not affected the engine room or the ship's power, so Trion gives orders to turn the ship and head for shore, so she could be beached. He also signals for the launch boats from surrounding ships to uh, go back, because they don't need, they're not going to be needed for rescue, the ships are going to be okay. However, two minutes after Camperdown's backed away from the hole she created, Water was advancing over the deck and spilling over the open hatches, and this stops uh, the party Lieutenant Herbert, Spit, uh, Herbert Heath uh, was leading from being able to unroll a collision mat down the side of the ship um, that was supposed to patch the hole and slow the inrush of water. Five minutes after collision, the bow had sunk 15 feet. The ship was listing heavily to starboard, and water was coming through the gun ports in the large forward turret. At this point, the foredeck becomes submerged. Remember, that huge turret at the front goes all the way down in all sorts of ways. Once water starts getting in there, it can go through all sorts of levels. The engine room was still mad, and the engines running, hydraulic power to the helm failed, so the ships could not be turned, and there was no power to launch the ship's boats. Eight minutes after collision, the entire fore end of the ship was underwater, and the water was lapping the main deck. The stern and risen said that the screws were nearly out of the water. Captain Bork had tried to rescue his ship and tried to save it. He'd gone to blow to investigate damage and close watertight doors. Again, this is going to sound strange, but if I'd been thinking that the ship was going to be hitting and ramming, the first thing I'd have done is try and signal the rest of the entire ship to close watertight doors. I'd at least had it pass by mouth and uh, brace for impact. Shout! I, you know, Captain Bork seems to have spent most of his time trying to get the Admiral to agree with him instead of going back to that first thing or the second one, which Trian had literally produced as a memorandum just before this exercise. When the literal obedience to any order, however given, would entail a collision with a friend, paramount orders direct the dangerous to be avoided while the object of the order should be attained if possible. Again, you can talk about Bork, you can talk about Johnston, you can talk about Markham. There are three of our senior officers involved in this, all of whom, all of whom, Could have done something to prevent it happening. You can also go with Trion. But he shouldn't have given those orders. We'll get into that. Victoria capsized just 13 minutes after collision. While most of the crew managed to abandon ship, not all did. And there was even the ship's chaplain, uh, Reverend S.D. Morris, was last seen trying to rescue the sick. As the ship goes down, basically the wreck becomes a... It becomes a, a death trap. It's a widening circle of foaming bubbles and... It's just drawing, sucking people down. Lieutenant Lauren, one of the survivors, states... All sorts of floating articles came up with tremendous force, and the surface of the water was one seething mass. We were whirled round and round, half choked with water, and dashed about amongst the wreckage until half senseless. Camperdown has to conduct a coffer dam across her main deck to stop the flooding. 
the watertight doors in her had not been closed in time, which allowed the ship to flood. And it was 90 minutes later that divers managed to reach and close a bulkhead door so that the flooding could be contained. Again, closing bulkhead doors. The other ships, of course, all have more time to take evasive action and manage to avoid. Um, Trian himself had stayed on the chops of the Shard House as the ship sank, accompanied by Hawking Smith. While Smith survived, Trian didn't. Trian was less fit than Smith was. Now, there are some interesting discussions in the inquiry afterwards. Basically, the Royal Navy sends out Admiral Seymour, who is a very experienced officer. Michael Clune Seymour, he's a safe pair of hands. He's a full admiral when he's sent out there to take up command. And he's a trusted pair of hands. He's not an innovator like Trion was, but he's going to find out what happened. And it's an interesting inquiry. It really is, because the public response is initially to try and blame Trion. But there is the fact that Markham's initial telegram to the Admiralty had only named the 22 officers who drowned and hadn't bothered to name uh, the sailors. There's also the fact that they were quite worried because this is one of Britain's first class battleships, one of their best battleships. And many of a similar design served in the Royal Navy at this point, and yet it had gone straight down. But the ramming had shown that the ram was actually still an effective and powerful weapon, although we prefer not to use it on each other. A court-martial is begun on the deck of Hibernia on the 17th of July, 1893 to investigate the sinking of Victoria and to try the officers, especially Captain Maurice Bork. They were required to appear as prisoners before the court and, well, here's the thing. Admiral Trion's personal staff are not part of the ship's crew, so were not amongst accused. This is the point again. The ship's crew are responsible for the safety of the ship. The captain's responsible for the safety of the ship. Not the admiral or his staff. The admiral gives orders on what he finds his fleet to do. But the captain's responsible for his ship. There are several theories which go through. Um, at one point was that Trion had mistaken the radius of ship's turning circle for its diameter and thus had allowed only two cable space instead of four, with uh, a safety margin of two, further, two cables between the columns of ships. Bork 
doesn't believe this examination and uh, doesn't believe this and stated this explanation had not occurred at the time. There are also various people who could try and go, oh, Trian was nuts at this point, or Trian was suffering from some sort of, you know, mental illness. Again, it, it doesn't really, there are not too many people around him watching him. And he's definitely not degenerated that much. His handwriting might be terrible, but so's mine, and I'm definitely not suffering from anything, so... I can understand. I can accept. I, I don't accept that as proof of anything. Bork is also kind of strange in that he requests not to discuss a conversation he'd had with Trion at a certain point about his turning circles, and then he brings it up himself in his defense. So I'm not sure I quite. I, I, I trust that sort of witness. When a witness says, I don't want to discuss this, I don't want to discuss this, but when it suits the defense, I will discuss this now. And it paints me in a light and the, the person who's dead and can't defend themselves in a different light. Bort was questioned on the TA practice and on the system of command, and he replied the Admiral will normally go forward during TA. Leaving the ship officers aft, making decisions and running their ship. If that wasn't the case, he would remain aft. On this occasion, Trian had gone forward. In other words... He was expecting the thing himself. He was being the instructor admiral rather than the commander admiral. Now, at this point, another other officers are called, including Guilford, Lord Guilford, his signals officer. And he is the one who, along with Hawkins Smith, Confirm hearing Trion saying, with his hearing, it was all my fault. So, there you go, there's the blame. Who, mm, Hawkins Smith says that I heard Trion saying, it's entirely my doing, entirely my fault. Lufford claims it was, he said it was all my fault. Hmm. Hawkins Smith confirmed to the court that no one could believe Victoria could sink as rapidly as she did. Interesting enough, there's no discussion of whether it might have been more sensible for the ships to stay wedged together after they'd round each other, at least until the watertight doors have been closed. And there's a lot of questions about the watertight doors not being closed when they're doing these sort of manoeuvres, and basically the idea is they should have been closed, as I said. Markham was then invited to answer questions as a witness, um, although his status as a potential future defendant uh, allowed him to suggest questions to be put to other witnesses as well. He says he was confused when he received the first order to turn, and his refusal to signal compliance because he could not see how the manoeuvre safely could be carried out. Markham claims that he doesn't really remember and hadn't really been thinking of memorandums uh, like that would have, for example, the one when the literal obedience to any order, however given, would entail a collision with a friend. Paramount orders direct to that danger is to be avoided with the object of the order should be, while well, the object of the order should be attained if possible. Um, Markham 
claims he doesn't remember that, really, and um, he had been thinking of the safety of his ship. Well, if he'd been thinking of the safety of his ship, surely he would have thought of that order and gone, I'm not going to follow these orders. He tried to use the defence of the rule of the road, um, that if he had turned hard to starboard and thereby avoided collision, uh, but he responded this would have gone against the rule of the road, when further questioned, he agreed that the rule of the road did not apply during manoeuvres. It doesn't. The rule of the road is which ship has way. And by the way, if you're ever checking, the flagship, which has the admiral in chi commander in chief on, uh, has a rule a right of way, followed by any other admirals there in order of seniority presence, and then everyone else. So, in other words, the rule of the road is quite simple: admiral going that way, you avoid him, or her, or them. There was then a whole thing about um, the various issues. For starters, there were no significant longitudinal bulkheads in the affected areas, which might have kept the water out of the port side completely. And. There were the watertight compartments, 12 were initially affected, but if the watertight doors had been closed, this would not have been as much, or not as big of an impact. It was determined that had the gun ports and doors at deck level been closed so that the water was prevented from entering this way, the ship would not have capsized. These doors would have been customarily closed if the ship was travelling in heavy seas, but it wasn't part of a normal procedure for clo closure in a collision. Had all doors been closed initially, so that only the breach compartments were flooded, then the ship's deck would have likely remained just above water level, with a heel of around 9 degrees, and Victoria would have been able to continue under her own power. The important thing that comes out is that really Markham is given a pass. But, and several other officers, including Charles Beresford and uh, Sir Geoffrey Phipps Hornby, Published a joint letter in the United States Gazette saying that Admiral Markham might have refused to perform the evolution ordered and the Victoria might have been saved. Admiral Markham, however, would have been tried by court martial and no one would sympathise with him as it would not have been realised that he averted a catastrophe. Unconditional obedience is, in brief, the only principle on which those in service must act. Now, of course, the official signature book actually has in it, although it is in the duty of every ship to preserve. As correctly as possible the station assigned to her, this duty is not to be held as freeing the captain from responsibility of taking such steps as may be necessary to avoid any danger to which she is exposed when immediate action is imperative and time or circumstance and do not omit of the, of the Admiral's permission being obtained. The nicest way this is just not sent, uh, what this whole thing you want blind obedience to orders, but you are handling very expensive, very committed ships. This is not age of sail with seeing that this is not a few knots. These are thousand ton ships moving eight knots, possibly soon at 17 knots. You know, we will know, uh, know when the lovely dreadnought comes along, 21 knots, you know, various battle speeds go up much more. You need officers to be thinking. The collision is due to an order by Admiral Trion. 
that following the accident, everything possible being done to save the ship and preserve life. No blame attached to Captain Bork or any other member of his crew. Gort strongly believes that although it is much to be regretted that Rear Admiral a uh, Albert H. Markham did not carry out his first intention of semaphoring to, com to the Commander-in-Chief his doubts as the signal, which is his job as the second-in-command, it would be fatal to the interests of the service to say that he was to blame for carrying out directions of the Commander-in-Chief present in person. Here are the warships that come after this. This is the important thing. So here is the real benefit for the Royal Navy. The Majestics. Powerful ships, certainly. Strong armour around them. A lot more watertight doors and a lot more longitud and longitudinal bulkheads in far greater de uh, density than they had before. They've got far more subdivision. And they are far more survivable as a result. The other result is, is a problem for the Admiralty. Markham is felt to be significantly to blame by all of the Admiralty. Everyone gets the idea that Threon was trying to set his officers a problem. He had a habit of doing this. And it's when officers start saying, oh, he would have, if he hadn't followed the order, he would have been court-martialed. Again, Threon isn't in the habit of court-martialing all officers who can make the case, I believe that was a danger to my ship. That's why he's got all those memorandum in place. That's the other problem with that idea. If Threon had court martialed Markham, Markham could have produced the two memorandum from Threon himself. The Queen's regulations, the signal books instructions, all those things and gone, I was doing the right thing. He would have survived the court martial. It wouldn't have judged against him. Only officers who believe that they need absolute control of threats would have believed that it would judge against him, and that admirals are infallible. The whole point of Trian system was he was trying to set it up for when admirals make mistakes and when the enemy and scenarios change. As a result, the results are actually the results of the inquiry are um, further. Um, uh, there are further uh, things added to them. First of all, is that a rider is added to the verdict to the effect that states that Markham pretty much had no justification for his belief that Victoria would circle around him, and thus he should have taken action much sooner to avoid collision. And Johnston's criticised both for failing his own independent responsibility to safeguard the ships and for failing to expeditiously carry out orders when the collision was imminent, i.e. not checking that it was at full astern rather than three quarters astern. For some reason, both these officers feel aggrieved by the verdict, and were considering taking a further court-martial to clear their names. Seymour had to convince them they'd been dealt with lightly, and any further case would go against them. Whilst Markham does receive admiral, uh, retrieve ad, the rank of admiral before retiring at the age of 65 in 1906, he's placed on half pay without command and gets only minor postings. 
and when he tries to rejoin the Navy in World War One, officer their services, they quite, uh, quite very firmly say no. <clears throat> Interesting point. John Jellicoe was aboard Victoria. He survives, gets away. Without him, we wouldn't have the Grand Fleet Commander we all know in World War One. So, Jellicoe aboard. And Jellicoe had seen Threon's command structure and had seen what he'd been trying to achieve. It's interesting to note that Jellicoe does in many ways try to foster this to an extent in the Grand Fleet. He is not as much as a centralizer as certain other commanders, and certainly not as much as one as Beatty. So, here's an interesting question, and I know some of you like what if, some of you don't, but this is one I posed, and I had a discussion with Drakenefeld actually about this one as well and we both without me actually suggesting it to him thought of Dogger Bank with the advent of radio radio changes the command structure anyway to be more like the TA system i.e. officers can send signals backwards and forwards they can question they can do discussion uh, almost do discursive points but if the TA system had survived and matured and the idea was that an officer could carry out the spirit of their of their admiral's instructions, if not letter. You get a very interesting scenario at Dogger Bank because instead of everyone turning and sinking the Bluka, the German ships would have been pursued because you have to think the captains would have gone, ah, well, what he's meaning for us is to carry on attacking them. Not everyone follow that order directly to letter because that must be, like there must be something wrong going on here. Let's go attack the Germans because that's our primary purpose. Which could, of course, have had knock-on effects for Jutland and various other things because let's say the Germans lose more than Blucher. You know? Let's say they lose Seidlitz or the Flinger or Malta as well. The Flinger is the next ship beyond Luca. If she gets caught by enough Royal Navy battle cruisers, she could get severely damaged. So could the others. This could have an impact because, as we all know, the Germans have real problems with maintaining and repairing their dreadnoughts in order one, in finishing their dreadnoughts. Their choice could well be finish off a, bad, a, a, a the Baden or a Koenigsberg. Koenig. Their dreadnoughts on the construction. And. of actually repairing their battle cruisers. So that's the big loss, I think, with the loss of... The loss of Tr Sir George Trion. Because you lose an admiral who is the standard bearer for the future. Also, interestingly enough, you lose a possible first sea lord who could have been very, very interesting. Because Trian does seem to be going that route. You wouldn't be surprised if he does end up as first sea lord. And he might well have brought in a number of radical changes to the Royal Navy and in terms of its ship size and its development. He was a big proponent of things like future proofing infrastructure, as well as having officers who could think about it. So if you have someone like Trion in charge, one or two first sea lords before you get to Fisher. Well.
that could certainly change things. That could certainly change things a lot. Because it gives the Royal Navy a further boost. In fact, even more so. Trion likes long-range gunnery. Supports it tremendously. Here's a question. What happens if a Dreadnought-like ship appears before 1905 in the Royal Navy? We talk about this being a confluence of ideas which are coming through. Lovely what ifs, but the more interesting what if is the TA system because it's practical. Yes, Trion dies, but there are others around him who have supported it, who have been pushing for a similar system. And it, the, the whole of this incident is used to discredit it. Rather, in fact, officers and people who wish to discredit the system will do anything they can to try and protect the reputations of the officers who, I would argue, failed in the system. And the reason they failed is Trion was expecting better from them. Markham's a freaking polar explorer. If any officer is supposed to have the confidence to do what is necessary... It should be Markham. I think Trion is at fault. I think he does believe he's at fault. I do. I'm sure those statements are broadly correct, but I don't think it's because he does a mental, he does a mass miscalculation in his head. I think he's setting a test for his officers to see if they can think for themselves perhaps he should have communicated that he was going to test them better but when you're dealing with people who have nearly 30 or more of nearly 30 or more than 30 years of experience of naval service is it too much for the CNC Mediterranean fleet, a vice admiral, to expect at least a rear admiral, let alone two flag captains, to exercise their judgment when receiving orders and adjust appropriately. Oh, we turned 18 points rather than 16 points, or we turned 12 rather than 16. Oh, we closed all the watertight doors because we thought there might be a collision coming. Oh, we ordered our ship into reverse before the Admiral gave mission because we saw a collision coming. There are three officers involved who can all exercise their opinions. And they don't. Any one of those three could have adjusted the orders slightly and could have, under those instructions, survived a court-martial. But they didn't. The fault is held to be the TA system by many of its detractors. But it's not the TA system that's a fault. It's the officers trying to implement it. Because they haven't been prepared for a system where they are allowed to use their initiative. It's not encouraged to. And this is what was lost. HMS Victoria. A cute looking ship. Definitely a cute looking ship. Right, and what do we have coming up? Well, hopefully, Patron is live either today or tomorrow with the... Uh, with the... Uh, with the vote. I've been having a deep de de philosophical discussion with it about this. I'm also setting up uh, the various brew ships set up to come up. 
and we have the various long patrols. I have put in the Battle of Lisa and Robert Calder. I am thinking of what 24th July to 31st of July and 1st August to 8th August will be, because technically I'm currently supposed to be away for at least one of those weeks, if not both of those weeks, for a research trip. In which case, I'm working out whether to do a 16-parter on something or an 8-parter on something, or two 8-parters on something. So, if you have any suggestions for what you would like those long patrols to be, please feel free to drop me a line on Discord or comment below or note on Patreon, any way you like, or at Twitter. Please do make some suggestions. I don't have to start writing them till, well, I'll probably write them on the 3rd to 11th of July, sort of while I'm away on that week. But, um, yeah, please do send them through. With all that, thank you, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed this, and I'm sorry this is later than it was supposed to be today, but as I said, it's been a fun day, and it was a fun weekend. Take care. Thank you.